In today's episode of the podcast, I'm sharing with you the progress I've made on my little black or stripy tee pattern and some thoughts I have after knitting my very first shadow wrap heel. So if that sounds like just your cup of tea, get cozy and let's dive in. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. My name is Taylor, and I will be your host. In today's episode of the podcast, I'm going to share with you some updates on my current projects, which is going to include some thoughts I have after knitting my very first shadow wrap heel, which is a sock heel construction that so many folks have encouraged me to try. I also want to update you on the status of my little, little black tee, but this one happens to be striped as this is a pattern that I am writing up and a project I'm really loving right now. And I know it's something that a lot of folks are anticipating and waiting for and I'm really excited to share with you some of the status on that. At the end of the episode, I do want to share with you a little bit of forecasting or an idea I have for a new yarn that I want to offer in the shop and a new or future pair of socks I want to knit for myself. So stay tuned for that. But before I get into any of that, I do want to mention that the Fiber for the People shop update was this last Saturday. It was a very big update with a brand new collection of Nevada born, shorn, and dyed yarn, which is 100% Merino Rambouillet Cross from my home of Nevada. And it is absolutely gorgeous. So that shop update was Saturday with a pretty large inventory. And I believe as of the time of recording this, there are a few listings left and all of those listings will ship by March 6th. So I just wanted to let you know, go over there, check it out. And if you would like to be kept in the loop for all future fiber for the people shop updates, definitely sign up for the newsletter. That is where I keep folks informed of upcoming shop updates. That's the only place you're going to get information regarding fiber for the people shop updates before the update. So definitely consider that if you would like to get your hands on some really gorgeous Nevada born, shorn, and dyed Merino Rambouillet yarn from yours truly. And also while you're at it, don't forget to head over to the Wool Needles Hands website. Over there, you can sign up for the Wool Needles Hands newsletter. I send out a monthly recap to folks over there. If you are a member of the Patreon, a free member or a paying member, you are already on that newsletter list, so no need to sign up again. However, if you are not a member of the Patreon and you would just like to sign up for the Wool Needles Hands newsletter, you can check that out over there. You can also check out the merch shop and find some really fun uh, conversation starters and merch to help support the Wool Needles Hands channel. And kind of like this mug I'm using today. This is a little portrait painted by yours truly. And I feel like she's, she's just so lovely. She's so uh, kind of just not interested in anybody's shenanigans and echoes the statement on the back, which is kind of fun. So this is available in the Wool Needles Hands merch shop. Like I said, a great way to support the channel. All right, I wanna talk about the socks first. So I am knitting these socks for my husband, Brandon. So these are a larger pair of socks. I forgot to mention this in the last episode where I shared these, but this is a 72 stitch sock. So I cast it on 72 stitches on a size one needle using Patton's Croy yarn. And I cannot remember what the color is of this yarn, but it is, um, it's this stripe. You, this is a really common colorway for Patton's Croy. It's really fun, kind of marled stripe situation. It's such a cute yarn. I absolutely love it. But that is what this, it looks like this. Not yet, mar yeah, marled, it looks like this. I wanna say it's called like blue rag marl or something. So pretty, I love it. And I love working with Patton's um, Croy yarn for socks. I've only knit I think this is my fourth pair of Patton's Croy socks I've ever knit. And every time I've knit with this, um, sometimes it can feel kind of cumbersome because I feel like some Patton's Croy yarn is just slightly heavier uh, than a fingering weight yarn and a size one needle can make things a little bit tight. But overall, it's a really fantastic yarn to work with. I knit a pair of socks for my dad last year in a Patton's Croy and they were gorgeous socks. He wears them all the time and they're holding up. I know Kristen from Vol and Vine just finished knitting Dennis a pair of socks with Patton's Croy and she kind of says the same thing that they just stand up. They could, what did she say? They could survive the apocalypse, which it's, it's absolutely true. This yarn is fabulous. So that is what I have going on here. I'm knitting these two at a time concurrently. I have experienced knitting two at a time on one needle 
And I did a whole video where I was saying, everybody should be knitting two at a time on one needle. It's just the greatest thing, yada, 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 talking about all of the benefits of that and how I don't think that it's much slower and all of this. And, and I think a lot of what I was saying in that video was true at the time, <laughs> if that makes any sense. But now I feel like it is more of a slog knitting two socks at a time on one needle. It does, if, I don't know if it is slower, but it feels slower and that's enough. You know, like if it feels slower, whether it is slower or not, that's just enough to make me not want to do it. So lately, um, especially with this pair of socks and then the ones I finished prior to this, I kind of enjoy just knitting them concurrently where I knit a certain amount on one sock. I give myself a point that I'm going to stop and I set it down and I knit the exact same amount on the next sock and I don't allow myself to continue on any one sock until I've met both of those, you know, whatever, like milestones in each of the socks. And I, it's working out really well and I actually kind of enjoy doing it. And when you're working with a self-striping yarn like this, it's really easy to kind of figure out where those are. You could say, well, I'm going to knit to the dark blue or the navy blue stripe and then I'm going to stop and do the same thing on sock number two. It's, it's a lot of fun. So I'm enjoying knitting these. And I'm just knitting a plain vanilla sock. I get my sock recipe, for, and I talk, I mention this all the time, but I get my sock recipe from the Knitty, or uh, yeah, Socks 101 article by Kate Atherley for Knitty.com. I will link to it down below. If you've never knit a sock before in your life, look no further. It's just, it's a great place to go. The only way that I'm deviating this time around is I am incorporating a shadow wrap heel. And I have just finished the shadow wrap heel for this first sock and I'm ready to start for this sock over here. So I'm going to have you look at it. I have this feeling, this is a short row heel. I have this feeling that I did something wrong because it's not laying down flat. Like, I don't know if you can, yeah, you can see it's wonky, right? Um, and I just think at some point I messed up a short row and it's definitely not anything that I'm going to go back and fix because I just don't think in this particular case it's all that it doesn't you can't notice it. And I had Brandon try these on and it didn't look weird, but my camera is trying to. <laughs> yeah, so there is my shadow wrap heel. And I want to talk a little bit about this. I don't want to go crazy about it, but I do want to share my first impressions after doing a shadow wrap heel now. I did the tutorial from Holly Bell Knits. It's a web website tutorial on the blog, Holly Bell Knits. And it was a very well-written tutorial. Easy to follow. Absolutely easy to follow. And there's a video that goes with it too. Wonderful. I felt like this took me so long to do. And I am not a stranger to short row heels. I'm, I don't know. I just, it felt like it took forever. I sat on the couch for at least an hour working on this one heel. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I can't possibly be exaggerating because I remember, and I watched a whole, I remember we were watching something that was roughly an hour long and it took me longer than that thing um, that we were watching. It took so long. And I don't know if it was because it was my first time doing it and I'm double checking, making sure I'm doing everything right. And I'm sh I'm sure that has something to do with it. And once I do the second one, I'm sure it'll be a lot faster. But there was something about those double stitches or twin stitches, they're called. It's a similar thing that's used in the fish lips kiss heel. Um, twin stitches. It, it, look up the technique and you'll see what that is. But essentially you're knitting into the stitch below to create a twin stitch. And then you're coming back over those and resolving them by knitting them together with the original stitch. So it's just a, I don't know. It just took me a long time. And I'm looking at the area where you create those stitches. So the seam, if you will. So I want to show you the seam. I want to really kind of open it up here so you can see that seam right here. Now, it's real nice and closed. I mean, there's no gapping happening there. And I can understand why that would be the case because it's real dense with stitches. So there's no gapping on that side and then no gapping on that side. So it's definitely a locked tight. I mean, if I, if I really stretch it open, okay, like let's get crazy. I don't know. You can see like light coming through. I don't know. So it's a tight seam, real strong and sturdy. And I won't know for sure until after these are finished and Brandon wears them, if the juice is worth the squeeze 
in in terms of like how long it took to do this and also too when i knit the second one if it takes half the time with the same result then i'll i'm sure i'll think differently but right now where i'm sitting with this i felt like and this is what it looks on on the inside oh i can totally see where i think i messed up let's look at this side first because i don't think i messed up on this side so this is okay this is what it looks like on the inside of the sock right along there and then if I turn it this way, I don't know, can you tell that that's wonky? Yeah, there's something happening right here. Um, so once I get these on Brandon's feet and he kind of wears them and I can see how that fits on his foot, I'll, I'll be able to make a better, you know, determination of if it's really worth the time it took to do that. Because I know for sure, if I were doing a German short row heel, it would have taken me half the time easy, if not less time than that. Um, so yeah, it took me some time. Let me know if that's your experience with the German short row or uh, the, what, did it, what is even the, um, what is it? The shadow, the shadow rat peel. Cause I just feel like it took a long time, but I'm on my way to do it on this sock. And I do, I am confident that it's going to work faster. I know what to do now. It is in terms of knowing what to do. It's pretty self-explanatory as it is with any short row heel, I suppose, as long as you know your breakdown of stitches. Because when you knit a short row heel, you're creating a wedge. So you're kind of working up like this. So that means you're going to come, you're going to do wrap and turns or you're going to turn your work at increasingly more narrow points in the heel as you move up. And then you're going to then resolve those turns back out again. So if you were to open a short row heel, how can I like, I don't know why I feel compelled to do this, but I feel compelled to draw a picture. So when you're working the short row heel one direction, you're moving like this. You see that? So you're moving, everything is becoming more narrow as you make your turns. And then as you resolve all of that, you're kind of going back out like this, working your way back through and resolving those turns. And if you were to take this shape and close it, you would have like a toe, right? Like a, a toe. And that's kind of just how a short row heel is constructed. This is just, I'm assuming a method for getting a nice tight seam so you don't have any gapping. Um, I, don't, I don't actually know where I was going with that. But the point is, the point that I'm making here is that I just feel like I'm hoping that the juice is worth the squeeze, that it really has a nice fit and the the technique that you're doing there makes sense for as long how long it takes me. But get, let me know your thoughts if you've knit a shadow wrap heel before. Um, yeah, so that's that. I'm liking these. I had Brandon try them on. I feel like the length of the leg is really nice here. I went longer than what I usually do for socks because I feel like a guy's sock needs to be longer. I don't know, like a lady's sock um, can be a little shorter, right? But again, I don't even know if it really matters whether it's a man or a woman. I think it's like the leg. I think if you have a wider calf area, like you tend to have more like width in your calf, a nice long leg is better. If your calf narrows down to a more narrow angle, I think you can get away with a shorter leg. That's just, I don't know. I don't even know. But that's kind of where I'm at with these for, for Brandon. I think that a nice long leg. And can we talk about for a minute how well I managed to get those stripes to line up? Okay, so I, the, I took time to prepare these little cakes of yarn so that I would have them working out of the cake with the same stripe pattern. Um, and I did a little short, like a YouTube short, where I talked about how I prepped for this. And it's an unlisted video on my YouTube channel right now. You can't find it by searching, but I'll link to it down below and you can see it. Um, but it's how I prepared these cakes of yarn to knit so that the stripes kind of work out the same. And I'm really excited with how well that worked because look at this. Look how like right on they are. Isn't that cool? So super happy with these socks for Brandon. They will be done soon. Oops, tangles. And they are living in my little baby Magner project bag. This is a waxed canvas project bag by Magner & Co. I love this company. They make fantastic project bags. Look at that. That's dangerous. That could hurt. But that's a cute little sock project bag. How adorable is that with the leather handle? Yeah, loving that. So those are Brandon's socks 
coming along nicely. I have tapped into a new heel construction that I'm excited about. And if it ends up being something that just fits him beautifully, then I'll feel really good about the time it took me to do that. But as of right now, it just took a really long time to complete. Okay, I'm really excited to share with you the progress I've made on my little black tee. Now I'm referring to it as the little black tee because when I knit this one that you see here, that's what I called this. And so folks who have been around since that will know when I say little black tee that I'm referring to this. However, this one here is the same design essentially with a couple modifications, but with a striping pattern. And I'm using the same yarn here. So this is, let's see, I'm going to actually stand up and I'm going to put Gladys where I am. Here we go. Okay. Come on over Gladys. Here we are. Let's see. Okay. That's good for, that's good enough for right now. Now the yarn I'm using, which is up here, <laughs> I'm holding it inside the fabric of the dress form. So this is the yarn I'm using. This is a 50%, well, it's a roughly 50, 50 cotton and merino yarn from a company called About Strings. They sell their yarn on Amazon. It's a DK weight and it's scrumptious. I love this yarn. It's beautiful. It comes in little tiny donuts in sets of four on Amazon, but I love it. And that's what I'm using to knit this. So last time we met, I had not nearly done this much. I think last time we met, I hadn't even separated for sleeves yet. And we were just working with kind of like the yoke, but here we are now. And I actually have almost an entire sleeve. Look at that. You guys see the sleeve and it's coming together. So yeah, I've got, um, I knit a little bit of the body. I wanted to get a little bit of fabric under here before I started, um, working on the sleeve but I wanna talk about what I have here. So I'm just gonna let you look at it for a second to kind of see where we are. And then I'm gonna take it off of Gladys and sit back down and talk a little bit about this. So let's, let's do that now. Okay, here we go. Gladys is naked. Okay, so here it is. How cute. All right, so the original little black tee had little tiny cap sleeves, as you may remember. I'm going to pop it up again so that you can see. So the little cap sleeves that you see here, I had mentioned that I didn't knit anything, that those are, I separated for sleeves and then I went back to the sleeve stitches and just bound off immediately. That's not entirely true. After looking on that, uh, looking at the pattern, excuse me, looking at that sweater closer, I realized I actually knit about four rounds and then I bound off. Not a huge difference, but I think I did that because I wanted to make sure that that underarm area had something there um, to constitute some kind of a sleeve to give it just a more flattering look underneath the arm. Like if you were to lift your arm, there would be something there besides just a raw edge of stitches. And so I knit about four stitches to create that little bit there. And then I bound off to what is a really lovely cap sleeve. Well, this second version of that, I wanted to do something different. I wanted it to be about a seven inch sleeve, meaning seven inches from the underarm. And that, because the underarm on this particular tee is about an inch more than my actual underarm or armhole depth, I should say. So just to let you know what that means, armhole depth is the distance from here into your armpit, like all up in your business down here. Whatever that length is, is your armhole depth. And when you add ease to that, you're adding this right here. You're adding a little bit of distance between the actual underarm of the sweater and your armpit, essentially. This particular sweater or shirt, I should say, has about an inch and a half. I would say it's closer to, well, that's about an inch and a half of additional armhole depth, uh, positive my own armhole depth. And so considering that, I wanted it the sleeve to be an additional seven inches in length. So that would make it eight and a half inches from my actual armhole depth down to where the sleeve would hit my arm, which would put that to roughly, if I were to stick this ruler up into my armpit, eight and a half inches, like almost like right to the turn in my elbow. So not quite, but about right here. I wanted the sleeve to hit lower down on the arm because I feel like little shirts like this 
with a sleeve that kind of comes down a little bit lower is such a flattering look. And I really wanted to go with that with this. It kind of reminds me of those vintage 70s ringer tees that you see people wearing sometimes and that people would wear a lot you know, back in the 70s and 80s, even in the 90s, I had one, but they just, um, they hit you right above the elbow. And I kind of wanted that for this version of the tee. And that's where we are so far. So right now I am just knitting the cuff of this sleeve and that's going to follow the same kind of construction as the neckline, which is right here which is a nice tight one by one rib followed by a really nice little pearl bump ridge there. So pretty. And one thing I also wanted to consider as I was doing this and I started thinking about it when I got to the point, um, when I started getting closer towards the end of the sleeve is I wanted to make sure that there was a really nice gap of gray fabric before doing the cuff to kind of replicate the same look going on up here on the yoke of the sweater where there's gray being knit before the stripes start. So I wanted a little bit of break in the stripes before I knit my cuff. So I'm doing that there and I'm going to do that at the bottom of the body of the sweater as well. And I think it looks so chic and classic. I also did a little bit of tapering on the sleeve just to bring it in ever so slightly. I didn't want to taper it too much to where I don't know. I wanted it to be nice and loose fitting, not super loose fitting, but not tight to the arm. But I did want it to have a little bit of shape to it. Also knowing that when I go down a needle size for the cuff here, it's going to bring it in even more. So you can kind of see that. If I hold this up, you can kind of see the shape of the sleeve. It does have a little bit of a taper to it. So this has one, two, three, four, five. I have four more rounds of ribbing to do here. And then... I will move on to, I'm not sure if I'm going to go on to the next sleeve. Yeah, I think at that point I will just go on and finish the next sleeve and then move on to the body of the sweater and finish it. So I think that the next time we meet, I will at least have another sleeve finished and half of the body, if not the entire thing complete. And I'm loving it. I love it so much. Oh, I did go up. I'm realizing this is kind of a thing for me is I'm going up a needle size on my sleeves because I'm finding that with a smaller circumference, I tend to knit a little bit more tightly. I don't know if you can really tell too much the fabric tension change, but the yoke of the sweater is on one needle size and this portion of the sleeve is on one uh, step larger in needle size. There's a slight change in tension, but overall the gauge is not, I think if the gauge is any different, it's by such a small amount that it's negligible but it just ensures that I don't have a, like a sleeve that's just too tight because of the tension increase when I knit with a smaller circumference. So there's that. Now, as I have done this, there are some things I've done here that I don't want to do in the final pattern. So when I write the pattern, there's some things that I've done here that I go into my notes like, okay, do this instead of this, or don't do this next time or something like that. Um, and some of that has a lot more to do with the striping than it does with the actual construction of the sweater. If I were knitting this in a solid color, these things probably wouldn't even be coming up. But if you look under, it's kind of, I don't know, it's not embarrassing, but it's, if you look under the arm, I don't know if you can tell, it's kind of just, obviously there's jogs in the stripes because I'm not using the helical knitting method because in my personal opinion, you don't need to do that. It just, it, life's too short. These are handmade sweaters. Like just who cares if your stripes have jogs in them. Um, so yeah, there's that. I get it for color, uh, like variegated colors. Fine. I'm just saying for like stripes, like stripes are supposed to have jogs. It doesn't matter. So whatever. <laughs> so I'm not doing anything here. This is just regular striping. There is a technique, you know, sidebar. There is a technique for uh, jogless stripes. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It exists. It's super easy and it's nothing is like, in my opinion, um, you don't have to put as much thought into it as you do helical knitting, which I do think if you really want jogless stripes is a great way to go. If I find the tutorial, I'll link to it down below. You could just Google how to knit jogless stripes and I'm sure this will come up. I know a lot of Danish patterns use this. Okay, whatever. Back to this. So under here, there were some things that I did that I probably won't do in the final pattern in terms of the tapering of the sleeve and which kinds of decreases I'm using. It's not worth really mentioning all that much right now because it won't matter. 
An another thing though that I did is if you notice the stripe of black right under the arm, it's much wider here. It's actually one row wider than the others. That, however, was not intentional. I just realized it was going to happen that way when I cast or added my needle back to start knitting my sleeve, but I kind of dig the way that looks. I don't know. I kind of like how under the arm there's one stripe under there that's kind of wide. I don't know what it is I like about that, but I kind of like that. So I'm just going to go with that. I don't know how that will be written into the pattern, honestly. Uh, in terms of the striping that I'm doing here, that is not... I did not intend for this to be a striped pattern. And honestly, I would really like to write this with no stripes. I'm using stripes because I had yarn constraints. I needed to... I was going to run out of yarn, and so I incorporated another color that I had to save money. And there's that. But I had really no interest in making this a striped pattern where I shared exactly how I do this. And so I may or may not incorporate the stripes in the pattern. And this might just be a sample. And then I would encourage folks to come up with their own striping pattern and just kind of have fun with that. But um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's what I'm going to do with this yet. But who knows? So anyway, I feel like I'm kind of just going on and on now about some of my stream of consciousness type thoughts with this. But I really love where this is going. I'm loving the sleeve length. If I can like, yeah, so cute. How cute. Such a wearable sweater. It has, you can tell there's wool in this yarn. It has that really nice earthy feel, but the cotton is so lovely. It feels more like cotton, but not as dense as an all cotton with a little bit of that rustic, tiny rustic halo from the wool. Let's see if you can. It's so nice. Oh, that was another thing I wanted to mention. So as you may know, especially if you're a member of the Patreon and you've been working in the Frank and Cal, I'm a big fan of the Italian bind off. I think it's t the juice is worth the squeeze in terms of how you go about doing it and the time it takes to do it. I think it's beautiful. I'm not using it here and I am doing a ribbing on my cuff and this would be a great place to do an Italian bind off, but I'm not doing it here and I'm that's intentional. I did not do it on the neck. Well, I wouldn't have done it on the neckline because that's a cast on, but I did not do a tubular cast on, which is essentially a cast on version of the Italian bind off because I wanted a really rigid edge. I wanted it to be nice and sturdy and rigid and a long tail cast on gives you that structure. And I want the same thing for the edge of the ribbing on the sleeve. I want it to be rigid and sturdy. I don't want it to be stretchy, overly stretchy and potential or provide any potential for losing its shape. I want it to fit nicely around the arm and hold that structure. And so I am not doing an Italian bind off here. So that is my little black tea, if you will. I'm loving the process. I'm loving the project. I can't wait to have it finished. Um, yeah, it's just been a lot of fun. And I imagine it's going to be finished pretty quickly. I've been working on it quite a bit lately since I finished my Franken sweater. It's kind of what's um, it's my motivational knit right now. Well, I don't know. These socks are a lot of fun to knit too. So I'm enjoying working on those socks. Everything seems to be coming together, but I'm hoping to have that finished next time we meet on the next episode of the podcast. So fingers crossed. And then I will be getting the pattern written up for at least my size. And then I need to work on getting it graded for more sizes. And then I have to have it test knit. And I will be opening up a test knit over on um, the Patreon where you can head over. Anybody can sign up for the test knit over there, but that's where I'm going to have that uh, down the road, whenever that happens. So that's it. That's my little black tea. And I'm really excited about that. Okay. The next thing I wanted to share with you, I, um, I had plans on sharing something else here. But as I am re-recording this episode, I decided to change my mind and share something else with you that is more immediate after I finish these socks, because it's going to be a pair of socks for myself. And this is an idea I have for an upcoming collection of sock yarn for Fiber for the People on a 100, either, I want to do a yarn that incorporates nylon, um, but I also want to do a yarn that is a 100% Peruvian Highland wool sock yarn. It's a fantastic workhorse yarn. It does not c contain nylon, so it's not going to have that added 
durability factor, but it's a fantastic yarn. Um, it's one of the best yarns to use for hard wearing items that doesn't contain nylon. It's just such a sturdy, woolly yarn. And so I wanted to incorporate that in the shop, but um, I'm not going to be dyeing variegated colors, but I wanted to incorporate multiple colors in a way that would give the socks some kind of visual interest, not only when you're wearing them, but while you're knitting them. And I was thinking about micro striping and little swirls of color that you can get in a sock yarn. And I came up with this idea of doing something that I'm going to be calling duo dipped sock yarns. Essentially what that is, is a sock yarn that is two-toned, or I should say not two-toned, but just two colors, half and half, completely half and half. So if I open up this skein, this is 100% Peruvian Highland wool, you get half Let's see if I can show this without it. Yeah. Okay. This might be the easiest way to do it. So half of the yarn is one color and then it kind of blends into another color and both of the colors in some way or another complement one another or create a vibe or a mood. And in the case of this one, you're getting this really gorgeous moody fuchsia with this really pretty, and it kind of blends in, you can kind of see it blending in with this really pretty brick almost maroon red. It's gorgeous. And when you knit this into a pair of socks, that smaller circumference item is going to cause these two colors to spiral stripe down the sock, creating this really fun micro striping effect. And I was thinking that this would be such a fun yarn to knit with. I want to make myself a pair of socks in this exact yarn but it would be a fun yarn to dye and to come up with colorway collections that kind of are inspired by various different things where each of the hues on the yarn, each of the colors kind of have some kind of collaborative vibe or cohesive vibe. I think that it would be fun to kind of come up with colors that you can use on either part of the yarn that are cohesive but have their own separate vibe to them. I was also playing with the idea of dyeing one whole base color, meaning that the entire skein of yarn is one color, which was the case with this. I actually pulled this out of, um, not this last shop update, but the one before that. This was a colorway called Carlotta in that shop update make sure you get that. Yeah, it was just a really pretty fuchsia, like kind of murky fuchsia color. And I colored over the top of that or dyed over the top of that some like reddish orange bronze yarn or bronze color to give it this really pretty overall color. But I was thinking about, you know, something like that where you have one overall kind of base color and then half of the yarn gets re-dipped into another color. And then you just have this whole vibe. I don't know. And then it'll be really fun to work this up and see the two colors play together. So that is coming to the shop very soon. I'm already in the process of coming up with some colorway ideas for that, but it's going to be called Duo Dipped Sock Yarns. And uh, it's a Fiber for the People collection. And I'm not sure if it's gonna come in March or April. I'm shooting for April. Um, as I finish up this pre-order update from the Born, Shorn and Dyed collection, then I will be getting in a new batch of sock yarns and going from there. So that's really exciting. So that is, um, I don't know, just something I wanted to share because I'm excited to play with it and see how this knits up into a pair of socks for myself. And um, yeah, I think they'd be a really cute. That was a really, this is why I skein up my yarn using a, a yarn skeiner and not by hand. Eh, eh, eh. Those are my thoughts. Something new coming to the Fiber for the People shop, but also something new coming to my needles for a, a pair of socks for myself. I so thank you for being here with me today. If you enjoyed yourself or took anything away from this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Definitely subscribe, click that bell icon so you can be notified anytime I upload anything new here on the channel, which is every Wednesday and every Sunday as planned, unless the universe has something else in mind for me. And if you would like to further support the channel, head over to Patreon and see if that is for you. There is a lot of additional content over there and I'm posting new content weekly over there as well. And I would love for you to be there. Join the community there. You can join for free if you'd like. There is content posted semi-regularly for free members for everybody, but you can also help support the channel over there and pay a small monthly fee to enjoy lots of additional Wool Needles Hands content. If you should decide to do that, thank you so much for even considering and for any additional support. But for everybody who's here viewing the videos, Regardless of anything else, just thank you for being here. It is always nice to be here with you guys to chit chat and hang out 
and I love it. Until we meet again for Wednesday's episode of the Midweek Ramble, happy knitting, happy making, happy whatever it is that you're doing. Take care, be well, and I will see you soon. Bye.